Hey team, welcome back to The Pillars, the podcast of the 363rd ISR Wing. I'm Dr. Reed in the studio today with Tech Sergeant Joe. Hello. And uh, we have a very special guest. Well, actually not a guest with us. This no. is a permanent addition yes. to our team. Um, so Chaplain Matt uh, is his go-by, and he's coming to us from NASIC, and we'll hear a little yes. bit more about that later in the show. But welcome. We're, we're glad to have you with us. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be part of the team. All right. So... You are probably a faithful listener to the pillars, so you <laughs> or I'll assume as Listen much. To all of them before you got here. Absolutely. Well, you know, and our listening audience knows that what's typical is on the pillars, we will take a resiliency topic and we'll discuss it at, at some length. Mm -hmm. And we'll usually try to share some tips for our airmen to help them be better wingmen, leaders, warriors. Yeah. But I think before we get too far into a topic, um, it'd be good to know where you're coming to us from, not, not necessarily uh, location-wise, but like, uh, I kind of want to start off with that age-old question of, why did you join the Air Force? Uh, thank you so much. I'm glad to be a part of this team. Uh, I've been excited about it for about six months since notification. So where I came from, what made me join the Air Force? So 9-11 was a pivotal experience for me. I remember where I was watching the TV. Uh, I just started seminary in 2001, and I remember that event just hurt me to the core, mm -hmm. and I knew that I wanted to be a part of that. Even though in seminary I wasn't real sure the track I was going to go, because that's our grad school. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so some of the other chaplains of the other forces, they said, Hey, Matt, Matt, you're you're young. You decently fit. <laughs> Maybe you ought to consider uh, going to be a chaplain. And I said, I'm not sure about that. Hmm. Uh, I had some political reservations up until that point, but a lot changed within me after 9/11. Do you mind me asking, uh, not to go too far down a rabbit hole? What else were you considering at the time? Uh, I thought I was going to be a an, an LMFT, a licensed manager, family therapist, hmm. uh, but have the, the church leaning. Uh, so that, that was what I was going to seminary starting out to be. And, and then the Twin Towers and Pentagon. And, and then it took three months, honestly. I was pretty resistant to it because hmm. I, I wasn't too interested in coming to the military. It wasn't even in my mindset at all. But then through a lot of prayer and talking with people that actually told me about this particular career field uh, and what we call it ministry and said okay so three months later I started all the paperwork which is a huge amount of paperwork uh, <laughs> uh, and then in March in 2002 I commissioned at the Whiteman A-10 guard unit mm -hmm. uh, that was fun <laughs> <laughs> They didn't have any officer recruiters in my town of Springfield, Missouri, so I had to drive two hours north mm -hmm. to Whiteman. Uh, that was a blast. Then you have to finish your four or seven, 90 hours of seminary before you can come in to be a chaplain. So I had to wait four years. Mm -hmm. And then I was an IMA for, I guess, two and a half, three years. Came active duty in seven. Uh, so I've, since I started, I have been motivated to be a part of this team, knowing that there are uh, men and women of the Air Force and other services that are doing the mission. They are in a place where uh, things are great and also things aren't great. Mm -hmm. uh, doing the mission challenges the mind, the body, and the soul. And I knew that coming in immediately, that I wanted to be a part of the team that helps support these people doing this mission. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned 9-11. Yeah. I think last week we were listening to our wing historian, Mr. Nick Waller. He was uh, kind of doing a tribute and a memorial to 9-11. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned essentially what you had just said, which was um, it was a galvanizing event for you. And I think yes. that's true of a lot of our airmen who have now never known a time in their lives when we haven't been in conflict or in mm -hmm. war and uh, where this uh, counterterrorism fight hasn't been going on. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting time to, to take your first steps in the Air Force. And I think that that's a motivation for a lot of people. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you said you commissioned in 2002, but it took you till 2007 to actually put on the uniform hmm. as active duty? 
Uh, yes. Awesome. Uh, they have, there's a, in the chaplain corps, there's a chaplain candidate program while you're in seminary. And, and so that takes a long time, <laughs> it feels like forever, uh, to do that. But you can do candidate tours during the summer to exposure, to uh, go visit bases and do a 30-day oh, okay. tour. Uh, so I went to a couple of those. And then uh, as an IMA, after you finally get your functional badge, it took a while. So I, I had to wait, do those things. So I was functioning as a captain chaplain hmm. for those two or three years. I would say learning what this was active duty was like, that was actually a, a unintended blessing. I got to do 16 months of backfield duty and see what the active duty team was really mm -hmm. shouldering. Mm -hmm. So I knew what I was signing up for. That's interesting. I think you probably just answered the question that I was going to ask if, if you... You know, if you basically, um, after 9-11, knew what you wanted to do, how do you stay motivated? How do you stay focused to uh, achieve your ultimate goal of becoming an active duty chaplain? And it sounds like there was a number of points during the, where you had those exposures that kind oh, of Oh, yeah, I could have turned you. back a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's why I asked. was like, that's a big gap between yeah. commissioning and then actually going full time. So I was wondering, mm -hmm. like, what kept you going? But it mm -hmm. sounds like you got a good taste I would say I realized my skill set and gift set and personality fit this mold really well. Hmm. Uh, and, and that's not the same experience for everybody else. I mean, we have retention issues just like everyone else. However, I really felt a snug fit and, and was very comfortable. I, I have military people in my family, a uh, great uncle, a World War II pilot, P-51 wow. Mustang pilot still alive. Hmm. Uh, 98 years old, I have an uncle that served in Vietnam, my dad was in Army ROTC, mm. and so, you know, it's kind of a family way, cousins and Army Marines, you know, I come from a proud military family, and I'm glad to continue that tradition. That's you, awesome. You just said the words uh, skill set and a gift set, and that's a, I've heard you use that phrase before. Is that something that you've helped other people kind of discover what their skills or what their uh, spiritual gifts or otherwise, gifts otherwise are? Uh, yes, and sometimes it takes a bit of coaxing because folks are just operating in a normal manner and don't realize some of it can be the nature versus nurture. Some of it you can train and get better at the skill set through experience and, and study, and some of it you're just naturally gifted. And so it's helping folks realize this is something perhaps that someone high above uh, imbued within the personhood that needs emphasis, needs reminding. Uh, needs sometimes we need to spotlight the gift set in others so that they operate in their full capacity. So, yeah, uh, I've, it's been an interesting journey being able to do that in this context. How does someone do that? Uh, they, they may be listening to this and thinking, I'd like to do a little bit more formal of an assessment. I'd like to understand what my unique spiritual gifts are. Do you have a way to kind of help people understand what that might be for them? Uh, there's the formal and informal. Okay. Uh, there is the... I would say just a regular one-on-one -on -one human interaction where we give feedback of what we see and what we observe. And then uh, in the, I, I would call the counseling area with a Christian emphasis, there are uh, spiritual tests that, uh, gift set tests that people can take. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are online. Uh, they've been around 30 years. I mean, they, so it's, there, there's, uh, I would say some science behind it as well as not just good ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a person could take a test within those communities and I don't know off the top of my head because there's a number of them. Uh, but we can be encouraged of what your, your natural leanings are, what we even call spiritual gifts are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that, that's a helpful way for people to find what those are. Well, I know that, so, so I don't want to make any assumptions here, but I've heard you speak kind of passionately, or at least on a number of occasions, I've heard you talk about how families that are going through challenges are something that you're particularly drawn to. And I don't know if that's because it relates to a particular spiritual gift that, that you have or, or, or what draws you to that. But could you tell us more about that, why that's particularly important to you as a chaplain? And Sure. Uh, the Chaplain Corps is terrific at doing uh, singles events and outreach to them. Uh, especially our younger dorm airmen, and then our, our marrieds, mm -hmm. uh, our, especially our young families. We're really good at doing marriage retreats and uh, supporting events for them. Uh, I, th I would think it's personal experience and 
also seeing the statistics for me, I happen to uh, have experience close to divorce and single parents and step families. Mm -hmm. And so that's an area that's close to my heart. I, I think uh, I, I've, I've been able to, while I've been in the, the chaplain corps, uh, some of my bosses have given me some leniency, a little bit of funds, so I can try some different outreaches to them. And I've had the pleasure and the honor of supporting folks that are going through those three categories, which I've given an umbrella term personally, and I call it challenge families. Uh, I, I think that commanders are starting to understand that, that their, their airmen, when, when, when home's not doing too good, the, the work's not going to do too good. Uh, when a single parent is struggling to be mom and dad, provider, caretaker, handle everything at once, uh, that impacts a person's ability to focus at, at the job. And, and, and so we have, I, I think, a growing need to take care of the, that airman community as well, mm -hmm. all three of those. So, so that, that's where my heart is. I just naturally can, tend to lean that way uh, as a with a pastor's heart of outreaching to them. It's interesting that you say that because there are a lot of folks that are now single with children and they're not jumping right back into relationships. Mm -hmm. We are learning how to kind of fly solo and be mom and dad like you mentioned. And I think it's important for commanders to kind of see that, hey, when the child's sick, there is nobody else. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell that member, What's your, your child care plan? What's your family care plan? That's not the solution, right? And so I love it that you're passionate about that because I think educating leaders to be more human about some of these issues and not so mission focused on, I need a body in this chair, but taking care of it as you know part of a family concept is amazing. I think that uh, was some of the feedback that came out of our Resilience Tactical Pauses uh, events in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Certainly within the wing, our focus was on building connections among yep. airmen. And um, that's challenging to do for supervisors, maybe especially if you're reluctant uh, mm -hmm. to kind of get to know someone on a personal level. Uh, it, it's really important to know what's going on in their personal situation in order to Definitely. be an effective supervisor mm -hmm. or a leader. Um, you have to do a little bit more digging and know what are the dynamics that are at play at home yeah. uh, that may be impacting uh, the mission. Yeah, I mean, especially if you don't know that one of your members might have an EFMP situation, sure, right? Yeah. Like, you have to be aware of that so that you can support that. Unpack EFMP for yes. our listening audience. Oh, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> Exceptional Family Member Program. There you go. I got it. There you go. Yeah, it just took a second. That, yeah. was, that was a test question. Um, we'll say, let, maybe uh, let's head in a different direction for a second. When it comes to Intel, I'll just say it that way, this isn't your first rodeo. I know that you came to us from Wright-Patterson. You want to talk at all about uh, some of your experiences at NASIC doing your job there? Sure. So uh, I imagine most of the listening audience, uh, if you can listen to this, you may be familiar with the National Air and Space Intel Center uh, at wright Pat. That mission is an interesting one to be a part of. I had an office over there, spent some office time over there during the week, and I was also a branch chief on the wing side, so I was a bit dual-hatted for that period. It's an interesting world of NASIC uh, and of wright Pat. A lot of the history of the Air Force is there, and it's also still on the cutting edge of, mm -hmm. of the mission, especially in the intel world. And then Bada bing, bada boom, I'm over here at the 363rd and, and learning what it means to be a part of an art. This mm -hmm. is a great team to be a part of and I'm glad there's a strong foundation. It's just a, finding how I fit into what's, what's already here. Yeah, I think that's pretty typical. Mm -hmm. For a lot of us, this is the first time when we've worked in these kind of multidisciplinary settings. And maybe that's true for... Um, folks in various work centers across our units as well. Um, more than ever, you're being asked to function as a part of a small team maybe mm -hmm. where you bring some expertise or your discipline or your particular trade craft to a smaller, more agile uh, kind of team to get after a particular problem set. Uh, and that's certainly the case with the arts. You know, previous to uh, these teams standing up, we all kind of worked in our uh, stovepipes, you and your chapel, me and my mental health clinic. Uh, and, you know, we maybe met up a couple of times a year, 
when something really terrible happened. What a disaster response, right? Team right. meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. And so here we are working side by side, and that's kind it's of great. A, it's a it's a fun experience, uh, not without challenges, but uh, I think uh, we're able to do some really good stuff together. I just have one more question. We typically ask uh, the folks that we interview uh, kind of a big question, get you thinking. But my favorite question to ask is, if you have a billboard and you could put anything on it, what would it be? Great loaded question. Thanks for giving that one to me. Yes. So I've, I'm going to say from my tradition as a chaplain, uh, and I come from the Christian community, so uh, it, it's a scripture. And it's my favorite scripture I share often in counseling and from the pulpit. It's Romans 11.32. And it says, God bound all men, and I'll put in parentheses, and women, <laughs> over to disobedience so that he may have mercy upon them all. How I receive that and experience it is that the, the man above put us in motion so that we don't have all the answers. Uh, we don't have the capacity to be 100% perfect uh, with the intent that he wants to extend a heavenly hand down to us. Mm. Uh, so it's a bit of a reciprocal uh, relationship, but it also gives uh, folks grace when we think we need to be super perfect and we fall short or mess up or don't achieve the, the gold star uh, and we have to live with some disappointment. We've got to live with some frustration of, mm -hmm. uh, like we talked about earlier, of a divorce or a separation or maybe I failed. I failed myself, failed my family, failed at the job. Uh, as a chaplain, a lot of what we end up doing is encouraging folks after they've had challenging experiences. And so that is one of the things that if I had a billboard, I would put that and, and let folks know that there's, uh, there's support, that you're human, uh, and it's intentional that we have a helping hand out there. Yeah, it's a good message. If you need help, reach out. Embrace your imperfections, whatever you think mm -hmm. those might be, and just keep swimming and... Uh... Reach out for help, yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Great question. Thank you. Well, I think that we'll probably wrap up there. Mm -hmm. um, it's been really good getting to know you, uh, not you just so on much. the podcast here. Thank you. But it's been good to, to get to know you over the past week that you've been with us. And uh, you'll hear more from us. Uh, we're headed, headed out on the road this week. We're going out to the 306th at Oklahoma City. So uh, we'll do our best to record while we're out there. But uh, we want to thank you for listening to The Pillars, the podcast of the 363rd ISR Wing. I'm Dr. Reed. I'm Sergeant Joe. And I'm Chaplain Matt. And uh, thanks for all you do, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>